most of what's on the media and out there about transgender people isn't, you know, necessarily the only presentation of transgender people. And then musically, I just, you know, I hope that they can see, you know, the depth of my lyrics and what I'm trying to say. I was uh, born Wayne George Mahler in uh, 1953 in Baltimore, Maryland. I'd say I had a pretty idyllic childhood, you know, except for dealing with the transgender stuff, which I was dealing with myself. As early as four years old, I knew that there was something wrong, you know, if wrong's the right word. I started writing when I was in elementary school, actually. Um, you know, real simple songs. Um, of course, some of them were about um, uh, girls that I was attracted to in, in elementary school and, you know, love stories and that kind of thing. Real simplistic stuff. I first met Wayne George Mahler. Uh, 1972, I'd say it was. Uh, I was playing in a local group. And uh, the uh, leader of the group had told me that we were going up to our local high school there and that they were putting on a musical. And uh, George and another friend of his had written the music for it, and they wanted us to perform the music. Keith McNamee um, was a bass player when I was in junior high, and he was playing in a lot of... Uh, popular bands during the high school period and um i used to see when i did get into high school i used to see him walking down the hall and he was a heavy set white guy 
and he had an afro that was like out to here and it wasn't permed it was natural and uh he was just about the wildest guy you know that you'd ever want to meet i liked uh i liked the music that he was playing at that time the originals that uh he was doing that they were for the play but still i could i don't know there was just a sense about him that i said you know this guy's got talent he was putting together a group and he asked me if i would be interested in coming down to play with him so i came over to his house and uh he had a couple of people and i had some of my own friends that i wanted to bring into the group so uh at that point uh we sort of like merged together and uh, we started playing music. At the time, uh, Stephen Stills had a band called Manassas. And so we figured if he could name a band after a town, so could we. So we called it Jessup. Wayne, I could tell at that time where George was not really too happy with doing cover material. And he had formed another group on the side that was basically doing a lot of original music. I could tell that there was a... Uh, a uh, feeling that he wanted to go out and do his own thing and do his own music. So, uh, and I respected that. Uh, we tried to do a couple of his songs, but we were basically a top 40 cover band. You know, he's one of my oldest and dearest friends. And, you know, he was the first person I really, really told about my gender issues. He really thought that I knew about it. And I was completely blown away because I had no idea. I mean, here's a cat that... Uh, Many times we were playing, he was the one that would get all the girls, you know, in the band. He was the uh, the uh, the focal point of the band. A lot of people just thought it was a phase in me, and, you know, I may have even, you know, I didn't know where it was going to go. I didn't know whether it was, you know, just some kind of fetish thing that was in my life that I had to deal with on that level. And, you know, like some people were into whips and chains and, you know, things like that or or you know, what it was. I went to California like a lot of young people do because they think that's the place to make it. We went out there to try and see if we could get in the door somewhere, you know, be rock stars. I was proud of some of the things that we accomplished considering what we knew about what we were doing. We got on a show called Dick Whittington Show, which was a morning talk show, more or less. But the guy was one of the most widely listened to DJs in the morning. And I used to drive a delivery truck out there um, and and used to listen to him in the morning. And I took a, a 45 that uh, two fellas had produced a 45. Um, one song I wrote back in Baltimore and the other song was written by this singer friend of mine, uh, Tim. And... We recorded them uh, with at the two producers' expenses, and we took it out to uh, to Dick Whittington, and um, he agreed to play it. And then he invited us on to the show, and I think the drummer in that band and myself were the only ones that would get up and go to the show, and the rest of the guys didn't do anything, and the writing was kind of like on the wall at that point. The group split up and everybody went their way. I I came back, uh, I don't know, six months after the singer came back. And I put together a group called Georgie Jessup and the Jewels. And the, and the uh, that's where Georgie Jessup first originated from. And Mac is the one that came up with that name because George was my middle name, given middle name. And he used to hear my father when he'd come home from work. And, you know, if I was down there, he'd say Georgie or whatever, refer to me as Georgie. And so Matt came up with George E. Jessup and the Jewels. And, uh, you know, I was really into like the retro uh, R&B was going on at the Blues Brothers had been out and or had just come out and, um you know, I was doing a lot of the old Wilson Pickett and Otis Redding and Aretha Franklin and all those kinds of songs, and along with my originals. And so that was the first band that I fronted. And I actually I actually got a keyboard player and had a keyboard player so I could just sing. And we played around for a couple of years. And uh, then using that same name, I hooked up with Mac again and uh, a couple guys that... Um, Mac knew, and uh, we did a demo of five songs for a 
songwriting, uh, not a songwriting, but a band contest. And uh, we actually came in second. From that point on, you know, we were in and out of groups together over the next, I don't know, 20 or 30 years, probably. But uh, one group that uh, we really uh, enjoyed doing was uh, Wavelength. And that was a group that uh, mainly did uh, top 40 rhythm and blues rock. But we also did a lot of George's originals. I told you it was an excellent week ahead, and I promised you some excellent music tonight, and you are about to get it. A stellar band whose music has been called American Rock and Roll, like Bruce Springsteen or Bob Seger. Ladies and gentlemen, the original sounds of Wavelength. some tasty music thank you ladies and gentlemen of wavelength and if you'd like to see them live and i'm sure that the experience is doubly good it, everything's kind of like a you know everything's kind of jammed together because when i move on from something i just move on from it and like people talk like old high school friends get together and talk about how you know we all oh, remember when we used to do this well nine times out of ten i don't 
you know, I live in the moment, in that moment, so it's hard for me to retain a lot of details, but I do know that there's photos of me where you can see breast growth uh, when I was still with Wavelength. And my wife left me um, and threw in the towel, <laughs> if you will. Um, when that split up occurred, about two weeks later, the band Wavelamp split up. That was pretty much certainly one of the worst times in my life that I've ever had. I think I would have to say it was the worst time in my life because, uh, you know, I lost my wife, who I was really in love with. And like a lot of transgender people, when they get in a crisis situation like that, they do what's called purging. And so you get rid of all these nice clothes that you've acquired over a period of time because you're not going to do this anymore. And you're going to make your marriage work and you're going to be a good uh, heterosexual husband for your wife. And so um, I went through that period which was really hard on myself and, and, and uh, uh, hard on, for me to concentrate on anything else. And um, of course, losing the band, I, you know, I didn't, it was a really good band and, and I didn't even see it coming. George didn't really, in Wavelength, didn't really change that much in his appearance. Even though we all knew about it, it was still something that he had in the closet. But no, that wasn't anything, I don't think anybody held that against him as far as that goes in the band. I mean, they might not have been happy with it, probably thought he was a little strange. But to this day, you can ask every one of those guys and they'll say, he's still a damn good songwriter. I didn't tell any members of my family until after my wife left me. And uh, of course, I was very depressed about that. And, you know, they were encouraging me. And frankly, they really loved my ex-wife a lot and uh, couldn't understand it, why she would just leave me. And, you know, it was becoming her fault. And I could not just sit by and watch them blame her when I knew the reasons that we had split up were directly from me. And so that's when I, you know, I told them. They didn't get all emotional. Um, you know, that I told them I was in therapy and they knew that. And uh, uh, they just basically, their comment was that they, you know, they didn't really understand it and they couldn't imagine why I feel that way or how I feel that way. And, um, you know, I, of course, didn't know really what to tell them myself. And, um, but they didn't jump up and down and get crazy or anything. But it was it wasn't until later that there was a little bit of tension between my father and I over the issue. The fact that uh, uh, my body was changing never really came up as a, a as an issue because, you know, again, with having compassion for my family, they knew about me. They knew the story. I wasn't going to walk around, you know, in a in a you know, bathing suit in front of them to shove it down their throats. So when I was around my family, I mean, I like wearing overalls, obviously, or I wouldn't be wearing them. Um, but when I was around my family, I would wear something like this because it, you know, covered up my breasts. So they didn't have to be, you know, we could focus on the family and not on that issue. They already knew about the issue. There was no reason to force it on them. And I think a lot of transgender people do that. They just try to force it on everybody and shove it down your throat. And, you know, it's, I'm a songwriter who happens to be a transsexual. That's all I am. And, you know, it shouldn't really be an issue. I know that it is. We're talking about it, you know, so it's, it's, it's an issue that people have curiosity and why shouldn't they? They don't understand it. But when we say to them, we don't understand it any more than you do. We're in the same boat as you. So now instead of us being separated, we're together. And there, that's where understanding can start. Because believe me, I would have not given up being Wayne George Mahler if I hadn't, 
you know, if I didn't have to do it, if, if it wasn't a matter of survival, I would have never taken that route. And I had kept going through all this period, you know, playing my music. And I had finally, around 88, I, that's when I actually transitioned in the music world. And uh, I formed this band called Winte and Crazy Sacred Dog. A, a Winte is very hard to define in terms of Euro-American culture because when all that started coming out um, and there was a kind of a move in the GBLT community, more the GBL uh, community, gay, lesbian, uh, um, uh, bisexual community, which more just gay, lesbian. It's, it's so hard to put what a Wente is into terms that we can understand. They were people, uh, as far as I know, it was a term for male-bodied individuals who, because of a dream or a vision or their own, you know, their, their calling, if you will, um, they were commanded to basically, you know, live their life as a third gender. And, uh, if, you know, if, like in the sense of a, being a man, then obviously they wore female clothing and often did a lot of female, uh, craft work and things along that line. You know, the latitude that we have as a European culture, um, on a, on a material level is huge. But the latitude that we have on a spiritual level is very narrow, and it's almost the exact opposite in what I understand as, you know, traditional Native American cultures, in that they had a wide latitude on a spiritual plane. So you were, if your dream said you were Wente, that's what you were, and, you know, and if you had been, you know, Chief, you know, Tomahawk, you know, the day before and you had your vision and now you were little butterfly, then that's who you were. You were little butterfly and nobody questioned it because it came from the spirit. It came from creator. And, uh, uh, so it's it, to talk about them in the same terms and say, what is, if you talk to traditional gay people, a Wente is a gay person. If you talk to transgender people, a Wente is a transgender person. The reality for me is that it's the only thing that makes sense for who I am and what I am. And I identified with it on that level. Um, and I don't really see it as a sexual issue whatsoever. I don't think it has anything to do with who you choose to sleep with, not sleep with, or sleep with at all. American Holocaust was a really hard album for me to do because I had formed a band called Wente and Crazy Sacred Dog when I transitioned and I was writing songs like Post Stop Freeway and It Ain't Easy for a Girl to Look Good and uh, you know, uh, Human Race uh, and, and Drag City was another song that I had written and all these songs were really addressing my experience as a as a transsexual woman in in, in white America, and um, uh, I was in that mode. I, my heart was in that place, and all these songs that I had written about Native America were songs that I had written prior to that point in my life, and so I had to go back and kind of sing these songs that were like really like typical angry young man songs you know she expected the album american holocaust to explode that everybody would be ready to receive the message and it would catapult georgie into uh quite a bit of uh, acclaim past this mid-atlantic region and her whole strategy was based on that of course that didn't happen in fact we ran into a lot of prejudice not only because of Georgie's uh, changing sexual appearance, but because the title of the song uh, or of the album, we had a lot of uh, music directors and station managers. Uh, at the time I was helping promote the album and I would take it around to stations and station managers would say, 
you have no right to that title, American Holocaust. Uh, that's a, a word reserved for the Jews. And I asked each person that presented that, I asked them if they'd heard the album yet, and they always would say no. And I'd say, well, listen to the album, and if you still think that uh, the Native Americans don't have the right to use the word Holocaust, or if you think Georgie Jessup used that term in any way that uh, takes lightly the situation the Jews went through, then I won't come back and bother you again. I also had a lot of prejudice in terms of is she a man or is she a woman? And I struggled with that personally in terms of how to present her, how to best enhance her commercially. I mean, they aren't pulling me off the stage and stoning me or anything. But at the same time, I'm not given the kind of maybe press that I may deserve as a songwriter simply because I don't think they want that image out there of a successful songwriter who happens to be transsexual. Georgie uh, didn't see that as an issue that she needed to bother with. That's one of the long-term disagreements we've had. Uh, but I'd go into clubs who would understand that she was a transgendered person and they would uh, act like being transgendered was a disease that was contagious. And I was, I didn't expect people to welcome Georgie with open arms. I think anytime you have a unique situation like Georgie's, you're going to run into prejudice. But I was shocked at the amount of discrimination uh, I faced in presenting Georgie and that, of course, Georgie faced as being herself. If you happen to be like a, a, a hard rock or a, a gr garage type band and you're a transsexual and you're wearing corsets and pushing your breast up and, you know, wearing all kinds of makeup and being outrageous, they'll promote you because they want to give people something they can laugh at or something that they can hate. And so the, the outrageous transsexual provides that. So they'll, you know, they'll put that in a movie or they'll put that on stage or do whatever they need to do with it. And then the other image that you see out there is the person that's supposed to be pitied. You know, the one that, oh my God, they had to go through all this stuff and do all these things. And it is, you know, it's a hard, transitioning is a very hard thing to go through. And it does take a lot of work, but you know, it takes a lot of work to be a doctor too. And, you know, to be, to be a lawyer and, you know, to be a great songwriter. And, you know, it's, it, it, the, the, you see them all the time, you know, the Maury show or, or Roseanne or, when she had a show or, or uh, Oprah or any of them and they have the transsexual on and it's like, oh my God, you know, when I was a little boy, I wanted to play with dolls and they wouldn't let me play with dolls, <laughs> you know, and, you know, they go on forever about that crap. But here's me who, I mean, I grew up playing cowboys and Indians. I wrestled, I played football. You know, I did a lot of things that were stereotypical boy activities, and yet I still felt the way that I felt inside. Now, isn't that much more exciting, or maybe that's the wrong word, I don't know, not exciting, but much more of a curiosity thing than the little feminine boy that says, I want to play with dolls. I mean, you know, but that's not what you hear on TV. I know Georgie feels it's a personal attack on him, and sometimes maybe it is, um, but probably not always. I think also some places are, are afraid. I mean, maybe they're afraid of how it will go over, you know, kind of like um, I was afraid sometimes to take Georgie to certain en environments, thinking, thinking that people wouldn't respond to Georgie or or, um, or I guess how they would react to Georgie. And, and maybe some places are like that. I mean, I understand there's a place he played in Virginia last year, and I think they, they were pretty rude to him. She had an appearance once in West Virginia, and uh, 
when it was discovered that there was going to be a transsexual performer appearing at this place, there were death threats. And uh, the show was canceled because the uh, originally, you don't know if that's a serious threat or not, but um, as the job got closer, the uh, county sheriff felt it was a serious threat. They, in fact, did find someone uh, who they thought was ready to shoot the club owner and or Georgie for, I guess, tainting the uh, soil of the fine establishment. Uh, that was somebody that doesn't know Georgie as a person, but just the fact that Georgie has chosen a different path in life than he had thought that was enough reason to hate. Uh, so Georgie's had experiences like that. The show was canceled and there's no harm done, except it broke my heart that Georgie had to back down uh, for only being who she is. Musicians have certain expectations and ideas about what they are. And sometimes they're not willing to be flexible enough to uh, work within the bounds of the music business. And I'm not sure that that's good or bad, but uh, it, it does slow one's momentum down. I think Georgie takes it personal, and I think it makes him angry. You know? I mean, Georgie is good. He's a good artist. Nobody can deny that. And I don't understand why he's not playing. I don't understand why his music's not on the radio. I really don't. their rituals and their ceremonies and the 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 ceremony or ritual for transgender people who are more on the transsexual end of the scale um is really surgery you know you can't use the women's bathroom until you've had surgery you can't be addressed formally as a woman until you've had surgery and that's their ritual and that's their ceremonies and laws and the rules that they set up. And so my transition was kind of saying to them, this is that strong in my life that I'm willing to go through your ritual to show you how pure my heart is and how sincere my heart is. Do I think that somebody who hasn't had surgery is any less valid than me as as a woman? Absolutely not. People who are going to uh, make a choice to go through a transition uh, essentially are telling the world that uh, instead of being a male, say, they're going to be a female. And uh, although this may be the right personal choice for them, it's a, it's it's you know fraught with many difficulties. Family may desert them. Uh, they might not be able to be employed. There is some around the country uh, decrease in economic uh, potential for people who have transitioned. Um, uh, they may lose friends. Uh, you know, they can be 
teased, uh, there's some violence and, and so forth. So there's, there's many, many obstacles to this uh, course. And in my opinion, it takes a pretty brave person uh, to do that. You know, many of us have difficulty changing our hair or clothing styles, you know, something as mundane as that. And here's a person who's going to change essentially, uh, uh, you know, very uh, dominant uh, thing about them. You know, they're, they're, they're who they are, essentially. I couldn't have pretended for some of the time to have been a man and some of the time to have been a woman. I, I couldn't do it. And this culture defines men who walk around wearing dresses as gay people, gay men, drag queens, or cross-dressers, transvestites. And that isn't who I was. That it wasn't what I was about. I'm not saying anything that those things are bad or good or whatever. It's just not who I was. And so I kind of defined myself more. And it also became a problem with relationships when I had a male body because ultimately people still relate it to that great holy symbol, the phallic, you know, symbol is even women worship it. I remember when I first met Georgie, he showed me all these videos, like of his wedding and then his bands and his family. And this looked like a very successful person to me who had everything going for them. And, and I, after looking at all these videos and pictures, I, I turned to Georgie. I remember saying, you really must have needed to do this because I can't imagine anybody having that much success and taking a gamble on it, which is what you do when you have go through this kind of transition. You, you take a chance to lose your family, your career, your friends. We know in the literature, you know, that there are incidences of where people regret their decisions. People regret things like if they've had uh, surgery, they regret things like the surgery wasn't perfect, you know. Uh, maybe we all do that to a certain extent, but this is pretty massive surgery so that they can feel like, oh, geez, I wish I had better surgery. Um, people come back, I see people come back quite often, and, uh, but it's more around issues in their lives. And the issues in their lives could be complicated by this. For instance, relationships that uh, can be challenged by somebody telling, you know, you meet someone, you fall for them, you tell, and then you tell them you're transgendered could be challenging in a relationship so we may see you know you may see things of that nature and you know and that's what's amazing about Georgie Georgie hasn't lost anybody I mean Georgie still has the same friends and the same family and and when I when I first was with Georgie I used to be worried about going to certain environments I didn't know how people would react to Georgie and I felt I had to protect him which I didn't because Georgie would go into an environment, any environment, I don't care how conservative, and would win people over. Let's go out to Remy and Don. Or does 
just been me Fate No, I meant to run that night Never claimed that be the light But want your sympathy Or your bloody sacrifice I will not die, I will not crash I will not crash so you can laugh Woman in a Man Suit is actually about my grandmother, uh, my maternal grandmother, Anna Josephine Blum. She was very, you know, influential on my life in terms of, uh, I think, a lot of the positive things that, um, besides my parents, she was, you know, very much a part of, I think, the good things about me. In 19... 88, I had a dream in which uh, she came to the house I was living in at the time and took me on a journey and showed me a lot of prophetic things and uh, some ancient things and in the end bestowed a name on me, which is uh, Donor Lesion, which is the only real important name that I have, and it means beautiful thunder. She's pictured on the back of the album in my grandfather's three-piece suit, and that's where the song title came, Woman in a Man Suit. And uh, the chorus of it is, Woman in the Man Suit is smiling down on you, because uh, in this dream, the message was that I was finally getting my shit together. and. Uh, you know, finally understanding what I needed to do in my life to move forward. In the spring of 68, the angels drove my grandma home. She lived a peaceful life. The life she lived was a shameless poem. All the way to heaven's gate, and God was there. of woman in a man suit if I had to narrow it down to one thing is about love and it's um, about um, the love that you get from family the love that you get from connecting to other human beings the love that you give for, 
from yourself um, without ego, without malice, without control. Um, and the love that it takes to sometimes walk away, uh, the love that it takes to understand that maybe you aren't helping the person that you love enough by being there. Um, so it's really about love, but family is a big important part because I learned so many of those values. I learned so many of those things from my, my grandmother uh, and from my mom and dad. Was I a good kid or a bad kid? Or... I guess you were a good kid until you got older. Then I found out some stories. <laughs> well, that's when I was really old. Well, you were in high school, I guess. Well, yeah. Last year of high school. Sneaking out the window. Yes. That's right. And I didn't know about it until then. Until yeah. Just a short time ago. Not very, yeah. yeah. He used to sneak out of the. His bedroom was on the set this level, and he just opened the window, took the screen out, stepped out the window, came back that way. And I was in. Bob and I were in bed, sound asleep, and we didn't know about it. And I found it out just a couple years ago. Hmm. I used to do it down Dewey too when I used to sleep on the side porch I used to go out the window there too. I didn't know that yeah just finding that out now yeah mm. my father is like if I had to like pick out a human being for another planet to uh, say well give us an example of a reason we shouldn't just nuke you all and I would present my father to to them and say this man right here Georgie's dad chief was an incredible man, um, a hard worker, just devoted to his family, devoted to his wife, it, just a great guy, one of the ni nicest people I probably have ever met. Um, their relationship was a little rocky at times because their politics were very, very different. We always had a feud and, and it, Mom and I have continued it on since Pop passed and I come over and I do this. And I do this, which I think is very appropriate, and I do this. Whoop, I do this, which I think is very appropriate. And uh, Mom always comes in, and I come back over, and these are, you know, up here or down, you know, down here somewhere, and I got to find them and put them back up. And, and that's the little game that we play. <laughs> I know Georgie shared a story with me that when Georgie first started transitioning, Apparently his dad caught him in a dress and like slammed him into the mirror and, and said, you're, you're not a woman, look at you, you know, you're a man and you won't wear a dress in my house and told him to get out. And then from what I remember, I think that only lasted a few hours. And then Georgie's dad said, you know, you're my son, I love you and this is your home. The day that he died, everybody was there. We were all around the bed and, and he died just the way he wanted to too, by the way. He wanted to be in his wife's arms. And he was, she was holding him. And Georgie was on the other side, up by his head. And then um, I, my understanding is the Lakota have a traditional uh, send off song, you know, and, and Georgie um, is an honorary Lakota. And he got together with his friend Two Bears and, um, and, and, and wanted to do a, um, which I think the song is beautiful. I mean, I, I think it's awesome that that culture, they have this tradition. Um, and they got together and did the song. And um, there's a prayer in it that it was one of the last prayers his dad said, because his dad always said this very simple prayer before he ate. It still moves me when I hear it. It's like I see a big image of his dad every time I listen to it. His big smile. I'll meet you on. And thanks for everything. The other side. You know, I got married to Angie. Angie's actually my second wife, ex-wife, you know. Uh, but it was, you know, I, I met her as a woman, legal woman, and, you know, she was in between the lesbian and straight community. 
And, you know, we decided to get married. So we went down and we got married. And they said that that was an illegal marriage because now I'm a legal woman. And I mean, how is that logical? What is the logic in that? That I can't be, and then are they saying that I can marry, I have to be able to marry a man because that was denying me pursuit of happiness. If they didn't allow me to marry a man, so they have to allow me to marry a man. So what a mind fuck. I mean, that was the perfect case to, to point out how stupid all this shit is. It's two people in love and they come together and they marry, you know, it's a marriage. I don't care if they're male, male, or female, female, or male and female. And of course, the, the right wing is going to say, oh, well, then people are going to marry their dogs. Well, you know, I love both of my dogs to death. Neither one of them can say, I do to me, or communicate that that's exactly what they mean beyond a shadow of a doubt to me. If they can do that, or if I can do that with them, I'd say, yeah, let's marry my dog. Why not? You know? Yes, I believe my political beliefs and uh, passions have hindered me uh, in my success. Um, I know that American Holocaust, which was a pretty controversial album, was pretty much ignored by the general media and by even the native media because I wasn't native blood. I'm just telling the truth as I interpreted, I guess, in my life. Georgie's extreme left, and I'm more to the right. But um, I think when it comes to the issues that matter, you know, like how people are treated, uh, we agree. You know, we may not agree on all the economical issues. We may not even agree on the war on terror, you know. But when it comes to the welfare of people, of individuals in this country, and even around the world, I think we, we're both humanitarians there, you know. And I respect anybody who has the courage to stand up and say what they really think and what they really believe. And I don't get that. You don't get that with a lot of people. A lot of people say what they think you want to hear. A lot of people want to be popular. Georgie does not care about being popular. Georgie doesn't care if you like what he says. He's going to say it. Georgie says things that can offend people on both sides. You know, I mean, but at least at least, you know, where you stand with Georgie. At least this is an honest. I mean, he's just very honest, very raw. There were all kinds of inspirations. I didn't set out to write an album that was going to piss anybody off or make anybody mad. Those songs just happened because they needed to be written. And I mean, that's my response to people that would want to, you know, tell me that I, I shouldn't be doing that. I should just be entertaining people or, you know, I shouldn't be speaking out about something in a song. There are people in this world that are going to look at a song like Greed from American Holocaust or Devil's Child from Woman in a Man Suit, and I'll never be able to convince them that it's not un-American and, you know, that it's not against God in some way, shape, or form. And, you know, I, I'm sorry. I don't think I can let the people that are never going to accept me. I mean, I don't even have to open my mouth and sing and I piss people off. So, I mean, I don't think I can let them rule my life. I can say that if Rush Limbaugh and, and clown on Fox News, whatever his name is, uh, if those guys are happy, there's a good chance that I'm angry and not very happy in the world. The same can be said in the opposite, that if I'm happy with every all the laws that are in place and all the things that are going down and accepted socially, they're going to be very unhappy people. And I, I don't have the answer for that. Uh, you know, I don't know. Maybe we should just both grab six guns and walk outside and have a duel and do with each, away with each other. I wish that they could put their rigid close-minded way of thinking aside and see the world a little bit the way maybe other people see the world like me and i i see i see where a lot of them are coming from with me for example why would a perfectly normal guy want to be a chick you know why would they cut off their dick 
don't make no sense to me. And, you know, I can truly understand why they're saying that. And I empathize with them. The only thing I can tell them is because this is the way it is. This is the truth. And, you know, if you want to put me in prison, it's still the truth. If you want to make laws against me, it's still the truth. If you want to kill me, it's still the truth. I think I'm somebody that believes in truth, and that doesn't mean that I haven't told my share of lies. I don't really have any things that I want to keep secret anymore. My big secret was being transgender and holding that in my life. And, uh, you know, when that was out in the open, there is no big secrets. What you see is what you get. Who cares if you see him as a, as a he or she? It's Georgie. Listen to the music. Listen to the lyrics. I mean, that's what's important. Look how Georgie treats people. Look how Georgie treats his family and his friends. I mean, who cares about this transgender stuff? It's so small. You think about the ridicule that people go through in life because they're different. Georgie's very different, and yet she has this great humanity. And she puts herself up on a stage and does her performance and says, this is me, this is, it's here. You just accept me or you don't accept me. And it's not her problem if a person does or does not. In, in a society where people are constantly looking for acceptance, that they want to be like other people, you have to admire someone who can stand apart from the pack and say, this is who I am. And who she is is a very wonderful thing. She's very talented. I like her voice, she's got a great voice. And uh, it's sincere, it's real. In our country, everything is the opposite of what it is. From being in show business and, and seeing people's the image they project and who they really are has just been really shocking a lot of times. That she is a true individual and it's, real, it's all real. And, it, and the same with for the music. Sometimes her passion is like overwhelmed. Okay, enough passion, I want to drink a beer <laughs> or talk to a stupid person for a while. My success as a musician, as a songwriter, I should probably be satisfied that my songs move people and they've been touched. You know, a lot of people have been touched by my music. For me, I think on a, on a strictly personal, completely personal, selfish level, it would be that I could make my living singing my songs and performing my songs and having other people record and perform my songs. And, you know, I don't need a lot of money to do that. What I love about performing is that I go into this zone where it's it's kind of like um, I'm a big admirer, as you know, of Fool's Crow, and he talks about becoming a hollow, a hollow tube for creator to fill up. And you know, he's he, you know when he does his healing, you know, it's creator that's healing, and you know he, what he's talking about is basically giving up your ego so that. You're not interpreting things and creators just filling you up. And while it'll be, I hope I reach that one day in my life, you know, what happens to me on stage is similar to that because I go into this zone where I don't think about being a man or a woman. I don't think about anything really. I just, I do it, I am. I grew up with myself as a male. And it's probably just as difficult for me sometimes to understand who I am as a transgender person as it is for people who don't understand transgenderness or people that have known me from the past. As difficult as it uh, for them to refer to, you know, Georgie as she. Um, it's maybe not that difficult for me because I took the journey, but I still have, I understand their perspective. And then there's people that, you know, have met me in recent years and this is the only way they know me. And they can't understand the other side. 
So I'm kind of, I kind of take all that in, and I guess I'm a mixture of my surroundings and um, the family that I grew up in, and the time and the era that I grew up in, um, and still I try to be timeless in what I write and sing about, um, and in my perspective on life. I hope when I'm, you know, my mother's age that I'm listening to good, soulful songwriters, you know, that have something to say. Maybe I should kill myself Could do it with some pills Learn to shoot some heroin I'm sure And maybe I should run away Would fade into the hills I will go where they can find me Where there are no bills But I love this life and all it gives And I love the morning song I love the way the sun shines through my dress as I sing along another day. I find a way to carry on. Now, if And I fear I'll take those pills But I love this life And all it gives And I love the morning song And I love the way the sun shines Through my dress as I sing along Another day I find a way